Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rick Howard. I am the Chief Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks, and I'm also on the committee for the Cybersecurity Cannon Project that we've been running here at Palo Alto Networks for about four years. My guest today is, I'm going to get the name right, Kevin Bear. Exactly. One of the co-authors for a book we are inducting tonight in our fourth annual gala, putting books into the Hall of Fame of the Cybersecurity Cannon. The name of the book is The Phoenix Project. Kevin, welcome to this interview. I'm glad you have me. This is exciting. So I got really excited about this book when I read it the first time. I've been reading about DevOps a little bit, but didn't really know how it might apply to me or to security or anything sure, like that. Sure, sure. And, and it just blew me away. So just kind of give me a feeling for uh, what made you guys decide you needed to write a novel well, about DevOps. It's interesting. I think one of the more impacting books that I've ever read, um, and Gene, uh, I think was one of the first people that had turned me on to it. Um, I had read it before and not know how to place it, which was Eliyahu Goldratz, The yep. Goal. Mm -hmm. And for those who have read it, uh, the style is very reminiscent of The Goal. And one of the things that's so powerful about using a novel medium to describe things is you can create the dialectic dilemma that often happens, and you can show both sides of it. So for my goal going into the book was, I want to be able to convey the conversations that start at the CEO level, right? Start at the, at the um, highest levels of the company and see how they translate into action down into the ranks of IT. Because I think there's a cause-effect relationship that is not understood really well there. So one of the things I wanted to understand was, how can we communicate when a CEO says X, what happens in IT? The, the kind of chain reaction as it goes right. down the hill. Yeah. Exactly. And so um, CEOs aren't aware of this in many cases. Sure. Yeah. Right, right. Matter of fact, you know, one of the things that Gene and George and I found was is that, you know, uh, CEOs uh, have strategies that are built for them and there's desires by the board to fulfill certain goals. And so they build visions and plans. And something like 93% of those plans require projects, some high percentage, right? And we know that 93% of those projects require an IT capital component. Mm -hmm. But we also know that a large percentage of those IT projects fail. Yes, right? I've been on many of those. Yes, exactly, <laughs> as, as, as have I. Um, you know, and it is, you can say fail, first attempt in learning, a few times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. But, but so the, the, the thing I thought was mo most interesting was, how can we show this and how can we educate executives on the cause for effect relationship, specifically as it relies to things like the way information moves, mm -hmm. fear, and, and these highly complex environments that we've built um, and are largely responding to. And then we wanted to introduce a lot of what we had learned over the years. Mm -hmm. So Gene, George, and I wrote Visible Ops together, um, which was a very, very successful book. Um, and, and, you know, it literally in some places dropped it out of airplanes. I, I go into a lot of places as required reading. And so we had been in, uh, Gene had, and George and I had been in a large amount of IT shops, um, trying to understand what a lot of these high performers were doing and what right. they had in common. Mm -hmm. And so then the extension of that kind of social uh, more uh, like sociology type research um, was then to do some empirical research. Mm -hmm. And so we then did research to find out, you know, hey, w what are the controls and, and what are the processes that correlate with performance in these organizations? We found a lot of interesting things. So as we were kind of doing more and more work and seeing more and more workshops and IT shops, we started to notice a lot of similar patterns. And I've been consulting in that space for a long time now, probably close to 15 years. Um, and, and, and Gene has seen thousands of enterprise clients at Tripwire and seeing the dilemmas. We worked together as CTOs for a long time. Yep. Um, so I think uh, you know, one of the most powerful pieces of, of the book, and you know, Gene really wanted to tell the story of kind of the good to great, right? How they struggled with things. Um, George being more of the analyst side yep. of things, right? So it was a really interesting combination. And well, I, I got to tell you that the idea of reading a nonfiction book about DevOps just you know, hurts my head, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> So to make, to make a novel, okay, and um, let me just set the story up. This is how I explained this book to my friends and sure. colleagues, right? Um, it's about an online retailer yes. who used to be number one, but now they're number three they, because their competition keeps beating them to market with better prices and better products. Sure. The very first page 
Okay, the board brings in the CEO and chairman <laughs> and the CIO. They fire the CIO. <laughs> yeah. They strip the chairmanship off the CEO and they bring this interim flunky IT guy up. You're their interim CIO and says, okay, you guys got six months to fix this or we're gonna sail the company for parts, right? Okay, that got me, okay. Right, right. Right? So, so here's a real story about my kind of people. There's even a CISO in it that I, I can relate to, all right? So oh, yeah. I thought it was a brilliant move to do all that. Well, I, you know, it's funny, um, again, a lot of inspiration from Ellie, but but one of the things that I really liked uh, about working with Gene and George, and, and I'll give you an interesting dynamic that happened during the writing of that. Mm -hmm. But first, I'll, I'll kind of talk about the setup, which is is that this is a common setup, maybe not as dramatic, right? Yeah. We took some license to make sure, a point, sure. um, but. Largely, I can tell you the scenarios that we talked about, even the dialogue down to the personas, mm -hmm. um, are all real people. Well, and, I mean, and that's, that's that's a really interesting part of the book. I there's think. one point in the book where you talk about uh, that there's the guy. Okay, he's the guy that fixes everything, right? And the, every, I've had one of those guys in every organization, and a guy or a girl, but she was the one that we would go to, to yeah. whenever anything broke or we need something new. Okay, and then we, everybody would just pile in. And then when you talked about that in the book, I was like, oh my God, it's exactly right. Matter of fact, I, I did a tremendous disservice so, to my friend Brent, who actually <laughs> exists in real life and is that guy. He's that guy. And um, <laughs> you know, I not too long ago got together with Brent and we had the conversation and he's been that guy in three or four companies. And there's an interesting thing that systems do to really smart people, mm -hmm. which is a lot of times really smart people, like any human, needs to be needed, yep. right? And, and it's also a validation of who they are in many cases, all that hard work they've put into sure. learning, right? And so uh, Brent, uh, a lot of people think Brent's a bad thing, but what Brent is really no, a symbol no, of in the book is a system problem. Yeah. And, um, and every new organization has constraints. So we were trying to use a human to illustrate constraints versus a machine like yep. in the goal, right? And I think this is where this book differs a lot from a lot of novels in the sense that this is about a complex adaptive system. When you see the human interactions, some of them aren't rational, right? But then some of them are fear, you know, these kinds of things that are in play. And, you know, the story of Bill Palmer is, is really the story that we like to all believe is true, right? At the end of the day, you don't need to be, uh, a, you know, an IBM fellow or, or something like right. that to be a CIO of a company, right? You can actually take that journeyman apprenticeship which is how a lot of people became CIOs. Sure. You know, I joke that, you know, behind one out of every 10 CIOs is a guy that fixed the printer for the CEO and then just moved <laughs> up, right? Just moved up the chain. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but, but yeah, so it, it, it was an interesting dynamic. I think one of the most rewarding parts of the way uh, we worked together and one of the hardest parts for me actually was George, Gene, and I had written this book at least once before and thrown it away. Hmm. Um, what we were calling it during the working pieces was the goal for IT. And then I took on the, the kind of more pessimistic view of when IT fails, right? But then as we started to go through the book, Gene and, and other folks actually pointed out a really great point, which is this isn't about IT failing. This is about a larger effort company. for a company. For a company to become literally a phoenix, to rise out of third place, right? And pull through all the, the things that they pull through, which are very normal. Um, so the outages, all of those descriptions of the things that happened are all real life examples that were changed to protect innocent people. <laughs> but, but what we wanted people was to feel, and so the, a lot of the emails and even direct messages I get on Twitter are people going, are you, are you in my building when you oh. wrote this book? <laughs> right, right, you know? I was like, no, that's not what happened. So. Well, let's talk about DevOps for a second, because I really believe that DevOps, this new kind of philosophy for all of us, is the way to change, the way we can make it better, not just for IT, but for security and yeah. all that stuff too. Um, and, and, everybody, and I go around the world talking to a lot of people about how they do security. And everybody says they are a DevOps shop, but I know they are not. By just reading your novel, they haven't really, got, they haven't really done the things they need to do to be a DevOps shop. They are writing apps for the cloud, and they're calling that a DevOps shop, but that's not really right. what it is. So can you kind of explain what do you think DevOps is to the layman, so, to a CISO? Okay, so basically um, the, the simplest way I can describe DevOps, and I think a lot of folks don't look at this, so from a sociological standpoint, it's, it's a socio-technical system. So in other words, largely IT right now is a techno-social system, which is kind of what existed at the turn of the century, um, I mean 1900, uh, not 2000, um, in terms of the way we organized our work around the machine machinery. Mm -hmm. So the engineers would come in and lay out the machinery, we organize the humans around it. Yep. That's a techno socio system. Very much like technology organizations. Yep. Functionally aligned to the things that they work on. 
DevOps talks about a new concept. You know, Patrick Dubois and Andrew Clay Schaefer, kind of what I look at as the real fathers of this movement. Patrick Dubois, you know, as a contractor, trying to get a thing in production as a developer, mm -hmm. gets the hands, yeah. you know, don't talk to me. And he's like, this is a, you know, a small task. Why can't we work together? Yeah. So literally, Patrick um, you know, started this idea that maybe we should get together and come together and talk about how we could work together. Mm. Meanwhile, Andrew Clay Schaefer uh, put on a talk um, at, uh, at Velocity. Mm -hmm. I was in an open space where he wanted to talk about agile infrastructure. Basically, the beginnings of a discussion at a large level about programmatic data centers, da you know, software-defined data centers. Right. Um, and, and, and so I think what was interesting is they actually didn't connect. Patrick was watching Andrew's presentation and nobody showed up to it. He didn't even show up to it. It was an open space. But they finally connected. And this whole idea, I think literally why it was called DevOps, is uh, Patrick needed a domain name for the conference, mm. and that was the one he that could That was get. the one he got. So <laughs> when people talk to me about DevOps, I, I have a different perspective, right? So, so really what I see it as is, is the simplest level. There's a lot of people warring against the concept of silos. What they're talking about is the bad symptoms of bad hierarchies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And DevOps is really, and you, you see people kind of adding things to the portmanteau about, the, portmanteau sure, sure. about the whole thing, DevOps, sec, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm really tired of it because basically what we're talking about is called cross-functional alignment. Yeah. And, and you can call so, it you know, Grand Poobah, it doesn't matter what it's Exactly. Right. So literally, Elliot Jacks described this back in 1989 and 90, and way before that, since the, actually since after post-World War II, which is, is that when organizations are correctly aligned um, across, we have silos for a reason, just like really powerful horses have blinders for a reason, mm -hmm. right? The problem is the way they're designed. And we don't design them with the flow of work, knowing that all of our work comes from somebody and goes to somebody else. Right. So, we can start to organize more around the way that works, which is what, what I see DevOps as an early symptom that we're going to change the way we manage companies around organizing around the work. And so I agree with that, right? And so in my whole career, we've had these silos of developing things and maintaining things. Yes. And there would be like six or seven compartments, but they were black boxes. Whatever mm. you did in that black box was what you did. And then you got done with it and you threw it over the side and they did what they did, but we didn't talk to each other. Where yeah. I think the great uh, the great innovation of what you guys have done here, what everybody in the DevOps movement have done, is really taking the idea of agile development, but moving it across all those black boxes. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and so what you said is developing is a system of systems, and not just little pieces that kind of get thrown over the transom that no one understands. Right? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think this is one of the challenges of DevOps, is I work with a lot of CIOs, both at the Fortune 50 level and in startups, right? Which is, okay, this is really great that we got this little ad hoc team together and they broke all the rules and they did this thing really fast, really high quality, good velocity. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I make this a strategic right. asset? Right, that's how do hard, I build, it's hard, right? How do I build an, a management organization around this? So this is one of my problems with the way DevOps has gone, which is, you know, you look at the statistics, most people don't know what it is, but everybody wants it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so that's a classic problem in technology. Um, and so I, I think, you know, what we're starting to see is people say, especially upper level managers, because this is largely a grassroots movement, sure. right? Yeah. So what happens is, is that'll lose steam as you try and work your way up and the message needs to mm -hmm. gain a certain level of fidelity in a different frame for executives, right? Um, and so while that's what I'm focusing on now, which is really what needs to be in place so that DevOps breaks out. The so, whole notion of implementing DevOps to me, um, first of all, I don't like mechanical terms, rollouts for humans. I agree. I yeah. Agree. yeah. And, um, and so DevOps is inherently socio-technical, just like in the 40s when miners actually go inside the mine and then they self-organized who was going to do what based on what capabilities they had. Yeah. They all learned the Pareto shape of each other's jobs. These are the high performers. And they did it in opacity. Their, their director was outside the mine. Mm -hmm. And they gave the director everything you wanted. Lots of production, no injuries, right. everybody showing up for work every day. But it was because they could do that inside. So what we have is organizations that largely use tactical command from the top down. It does two things. First of all, it means a very narrow set of ideas yeah. in terms of vision. And then secondly, um, you know, it actually, they need to do intent-based command. In other words, like strategic command, like the military does, where executives express intent, then there's another layer of organization that actually builds the capabilities, and then you give people some boundaries and say, here's your freedom to build the tactics with these capabilities. So DevApps actually spans two of these areas, yeah. right? They're building capabilities that can be leveraged at a tactical level. The problem has, all, in my mind, has been, how do you get the 
next level of executives to understand how to strategically use this. Well, I think there, but I, I agree that's the problem. Uh, but I think there's a window of opportunity here. Mm -hmm. As everybody races to the cloud, we're rewriting those applications anyway. Yes. Right? Yes. So if we continue to do it the way we used to do it, we're going to get left in the lurch. The companies and the organizations that figure out how to move to the, your, this new model okay, are going to just cream the competition, right? That's, that's, but the window is small, I think. I, th I think it's in the next five, seven years yeah. where we, most people have to get there. Exactly. Do you have any examples of companies that you know are doing this well? Um, yeah, um, I'm going to be giving a talk um, actually uh, at Gold, the Gold Rats, Eliyahu mm -hmm. Gold Rats Organization Consul Gold Consulting. Gene and I are both giving talks there. Um, I'm going to bring a, a, a guy named uh, Mark Landy with me, and uh, we're going to talk about how we built this in an organization, uh, a very large organization at very, very high speed, high velocity to deliver a very mission critical piece of capability for the organization. Um, but that's what we do. We're involved at all of the different stratum layers in the organization so that we can meet in the middle, mm -hmm. right, and build real capabilities that accelerate the enterprise. The thing we're noticing is, is that not all organizations need a ton of development velocity, but one thing that a lot of organizations do need, depending on how they're configured, is certainly the, the pre-existing condition, which is, I would say we like to build a vacuum at the end of the value chain that just pulls everything pulls through. through. And so that's put a real focus on IT operations in a, never, in a way that's never happened. Mm -hmm. To the point where I'm starting to see investment and encouraging investment in bringing those pieces in-house again. A lot of people outsource them. Yeah. Matter of fact, a lot of people are going to the cloud, but I'll tell you the leading providers now that have stabilized demand and have more mature pieces are bringing things back out of the cloud. Mm. So, so what I don't want people to think is, is DevOps is a cloud play. Right. right. It enables a cloud play. That's great. But it gives you options. Yeah. And that's what I think CEOs and more and more CIOs want as they have changing grounds around them all the time. They want to know that they can change course, reverse what they're doing, and have a flexible, agile engine that can just change quickly adjust. And adjust, right? So yeah. that comes down to the continuous improvement piece of this, which gets ignored by so many DevOps yep. teams. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my core test. If you're doing DevOps, you've got some sort of systematic way to improve things every day. Well, we could spend the next 20 hours talking about <laughs> all the things about DevOps. Uh, uh, the book is called The Phoenix Project. We are inducting it into the Hall of Fame tonight. Yep. Kevin, thank you for coming. I, would, I, I could spend another couple hours just talking about this, right? Uh, everybody who knows me knows that I can spend days. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you it. a lot. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>